hide the screen share. There, I think that's what I want. How's that? Go. Yeah. Looks good. Okay. Okay, so world uh, deep and on is uh, has reached that stage in his career. He, he thinks he wants to join real life and uh, become a doctor. And he'll convince us of, of uh, his credentials here today. On my introductory slide here, I just wanted to take uh, a couple of minutes just to point out something that Deep will probably point out anyway. But <clears throat> you see in that uh, uh, little diagram there of a color magnitude diagram of a particular galaxy, the tick marks on the left side on, on the scales, each tick mark is 10% in distance. And you could just look at that uh, color magnitude diagram and see that you can define the tip of the red giant branch to easily to 5%, just with your eye. Well, obviously we do something a little bit better than uh, just looking at things with our eye, but this is just to convince you up front that the tip of the red giant branch is a, is a honorable way of getting distances. So I was lucky enough to have Deep come to Hawaii. And uh, I'll show you that he's grown up a bit. Here's uh, some pictures that uh, he shared. And then with his partner, Sarah, here in Hawaii, they came to, well, Deep came here from uh, Boston uh, and joined me a few years ago. And he's been just a fantastic asset to my program. And, and he's done a wonderful job on his thesis, as you'll hear. Here's uh, the pathway that he's followed. And he's uh, gotten some fair recognitions already, for example, from the Arts Foundation. And, and he's been tremendous a number of publications now for such a, a short time. So with that brief introduction, I'll turn this then over to Deep and we'll hear uh, what he's been doing while he's been here. So what do I do? I'll stop share and uh, take it away Deep. Thanks a lot for that introduction, Brent. All right, let me just get set up here. Um, that's the wrong screen. Uh, okay, can we see just the title slide? Yes. Okay, excellent. I'll get started then. Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to listen to me talk. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about my dissertation work that I've done with Brent um, and a number of collaborators that I'll, I'll talk about throughout the talk um, on tip of the, getting tip of the red giant branch distances to nearby galaxies like the one you see here in the background. This is NGC 5585. Um, you see lovely, uh, well, maybe not well-defined spiral arms, but you see some spiral arm structure. You see uh, blue regions of star formation, and then littered throughout the galaxy, you see these red stars, and these are these red giants that were resolving in galaxies out to 10 and 20 megaparsecs um, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so I just wanted to get started with the, the driver behind this thesis, and that's the Cosmic Flows Program. And so Cosmic Flows is a compendium of redshift independent distances, and it's carefully curated such that we need uh, we require large overlaps between different distance methods uh, for purposes of uniformity. And so the, the aims of the cosmic flows program are many fold. Um, obviously, we want to study cosmic flows of so the paths that galaxies migrate along. We want to study large scale structure 
in a very real way by mapping out individual galaxies. Um, we want to set the extra galactic distance scale with our distances. And also, uh, as I'll talk about towards the end of the talk, we want to determine the value of the Hubble constant, which dictates the expansion rate of the universe. And so the fin final cosmic flows catalog, as well as a lot of the intermediate data products are publicly available on our extra galactic distance database that we host here at the IFA. The most recent published iteration of Cosmic Flows is Cosmic Flows 3, which came out in 2016 with 18,000 galaxy distances. Uh, Cosmic Flows 4 will be coming out soon, and that'll bump, out, bump up the number to 50,000 galaxy distances. Um, and our group's direct contributions are through two techniques. One is through the tip of the red giant branch, which will be the subject of the remainder of this talk, but also the Tully-Fisher relation, which um, Esan Korchi, who recently graduated, has been working a lot on. And I guess I should say there's, in Cosmic Flows 4, there will be um, contribution from a number of IFA uh, members to the Supernova 1A uh, <laughs> portion of Cosmic Flows as well. Um, and so what is the tip of the red giant branch? Uh, the idea here is that low mass stars, less than about two solar masses, as they go off the main sequence, they've exhausted hydrogen in their core. Um, they will track up all the way up the red giant branch. And as they're tracking up the red giant branch, they are continuing to fuse hydrogen in a shell um, up until a point which uh, they up until the point where they reach the tip of the red giant branch. And at the tip of the red giant branch or the TRGB, um, this marks that marks the onset of helium burning within the star. And so this point is called the helium flash. Um, it's very chaotic and it lasts a very, uh, very brief amount of time, um, seconds to minutes. And at this point, stars will jump down to the horizontal branch where they're much fainter. Um, and so at this point, there's a sharp discontinuity in the luminosity function of stars on the giant branch. And that, that uh, is what we use to measure distances. And so the key idea here is that due to the underlying stellar physics, the core mass uh, is constant. And so we can use stars at the tip of the red giant branch as standard candles, modulo, a little bit of metallicity dependence that arises from line blanketing. But that's something we can cal calibrate out. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is sort of a mock color magnitude diagram. This is an HST filters. So on the y-axis, you have F814W, which is pretty close to regular I-band. And on the x-axis, you have F606 minus F814. You can think of F606 as a wider V-band. And so it's, this is roughly I versus V minus I. And you have a number of stellar sequences that are labeled on the plot going from left to right. We have the main sequence, uh, blue and red helium burning stars or supergiants, the asymptotic giant branch stars, which are all brighter than red giant branch stars. Um, and the red giant branch, which culminates at the tip of the red giant branch. And so what does a real one of these look like? Um, this is for NGC 300. This is uh, taken with HST one orbit, um, about 2000 seconds of charge time. Um, and you see the tip of the red giant branch just with your eye even. Um, you see the discontinuity at the point between red giant branch and asymptotic giant branch stars. And this is the tip of the red giant branch. And that's what we use to measure distances. Um, and so what are the benefits of the method? Well, we think they're in the best case scenario, precise and accurate to around 5%. Um, there are 500 galaxies with measured tip of the red giant branch distances on our extra galactic distance database. Uh, you don't, need a whole lot of telescope time. So if you wanted to go and do this experiment with Cepheid variables, you would need a lot of exposures um, paced out at a, at a proper sampling to measure Cepheid stars. With the tip of the red giant branch, you just do one, you know, one set of integration. Um, with one orbit on HST, you can get a distance out to 10 megaparsecs. So it's a really efficient technique and that's why it's so popular. Um, and we're also not limited to galaxies that have only a young stellar population. So for Cepheids, you know, you're going to at least uh, need star formation in the past 100 mega years or so if you want to detect a Cepheid. Um, with the tip of the red giant branch, pretty much every galaxy that we find within local volume has a sufficiently old population such that you can measure the TRGB. Um, additionally, you can go out into the galaxy halos to measure the TRGB. Uh, which helps you get around issues of internal extinction to the host galaxy. And so how do we go about measuring the tip of the red giant branch? So we, we grab the HST images from the archive, whether these are our proposals or uh, archival. Um, we do this in both optical and near infrared bands. 
And so we you know, take the images, we perform point spread function photometry uh, and artificial star experiments with Dolphot, which is a, a popularly used photometry package. We perform strict quality cuts, things like signal to noise, sharpness, and crowding. And then from that, we generate a CMD and color images like the one I'm showing you on the right, which are I've sprinkled throughout the talk. And so once we have the color magnitude diagram, how do we actually measure the TRGB? A uh, popular technique in the literature is to use something called the Sobel filter, which is just essentially an edge detection algorithm. You can think of the truncation of the luminosity function of the RGB as, a, as an edge. And if you use an, run an edge detection algorithm through that, you can do that. Um, we do something a little different in that we fit a model luminosity function with four parameters, the RGB and AGB slope, the RGB jump, and, as well, and obviously the tip of the red giant branch magnitude. And so the benefits of this is that we can explicitly take into account things like photometric completeness, bias, and errors from our artificial star experiments. So we have a really good handle on our errors and statistics. Um, and this technique is also less sensitive than the Sobel filter as to small changes in number counts. Um, and in the best cases, we have measurements that are good to about 5%, a combination of statistical and systematic uncertainties. And so I showed you uh, this galaxy earlier, ESO 6-1. This is at 2.7 megaparsecs. And you see the, the, the great color magnitude diagram that we get from HST. And this is a little under one orbit. Um, the, the red giant branch is extremely well-defined. You could measure it within the level precision that we're doing just with your eye. But, you know, of course, we don't do that. Um, but this is, a, you know, this is showing you a nice clean example of that. And so we've recently put out an updated catalog paper describing our reduction and analysis procedures, as well as the components of the, the CMD's TRGB catalog. Um, this is just accepted to AJ, it's in press still. And so we've got over 500 galaxies in the catalog, um, all of which the photometry is publicly available. And so you can check that out at the Extra Galactic Distance Database's website. Um, just to go over what the distance distribution for this catalog looks like, we have 556 galaxies in total, uh, 489 with them with measured distances. The rest, we aren't able to measure distances. Either they're too sparse or too far away, but we provide the color magnitude diagrams nonetheless. Uh, you'll notice the vast majority of these galaxies are located within 10 megaparsecs. Um, that's no accident. Remember, I mentioned 10 megaparsecs, you know, with one or that's what you can measure with one orbit very cleanly. And so that's why the vast majority are within 10 megaparsecs. And then there's a little bit of, um, even with one orbit, you can push out to 11 or 12 megaparsecs. And that's the, that's the bin after 10 megaparsecs. And then you'll notice a trail of just a handful of galaxies out past 20 megaparsecs. Uh, and those are, you need lots of integration time, tens of orbits in some cases, which you can only really justify if you're trying to do something crazy like calibrate the Hubble constant with, uh, by measuring uh, distances to supernova host galaxies, which I'll talk about towards the end. And so the, the, the catalog, you know, the key product of this work is accurate distances, which are a significant value, not just to the Cosmic Flows program, but also to the broader astronomical community, because they set um, an important scale for basically every other measurement, whether it's you wanna turn a brightness to a luminosity or an angular size to a physical size, you need a distance to your galaxy. Um, and so I've added distances for something like 100 to 150 galaxies to the CMD's TRGB catalog throughout my dissertation work. Uh, some of them have been interesting enough to uh, gone out and publish on, on their own. I'll talk a little bit about those now. Um, so here on the left-hand side, you see the galaxy Coma P, which is this sort of almost dark galaxy. It's a very low surface brightness galaxy with the largest H1 mass to light ratio measured for any isolated galaxy. Um, and so there was an original claim of a tip of the red giant branch measurement at five and a half megaparsecs, which was a little troublesome because it's, it's an isolated system. And if you apply that distance to it, you get a peculiar velocity for the galaxy. So an intrinsic velocity of almost a thousand kilometers a second, which is, is a pretty, you know, how does, it, how does an isolated small galaxy get that velocity? Uh, it's, it's difficult to explain. We, we reanalyzed the data and came up with a distance of about 11 megaparsecs, which solves the issue with the rather large peculiar velocity. But then it has interesting implications for uh, the star formation history. Um, it implies that there's a large ratio of AGB to RGB stars. 
uh, which means there's a significant amount of star formation about a gig a year or so ago with limited ancient star formation towards the beginning of the universe. And so if you look at this galaxy carefully, it's pretty complicated in terms of its H1 dynamics. It's possible that the, the star formation has been triggered through recent merger of gas clouds. And so there's, there's interesting things to be looked at here. Um, another target that was important is NGC 6946, which is also called the Fireworks Galaxy. It's a face-on galaxy. Uh, somewhat close to the plane of the Milky Way. And it's been hosted, it's called the Fireworks Galaxy because it's been hosted 10 supernovae in the past century, which is the most of any galaxy um, period that we know. Um, so the previous distance was used in the literature was 5.9 megaparsecs. And so we, we put out a tip of the red giant branch distance um, of 7.7 .7 megaparsecs. And that has interesting implications for all the supernovae that have occurred in the galaxy, because that means that on average, those supernovae are 2.3 times more luminous than people have previously estimated. And so this is really important for models of the progenitors of these supernovae, including uh, NGC 6946-BH1, which is sort of this failed supernova that went direct collapse onto a black hole and didn't actually go supernova. Um, and people have picked up our distance in the literature and basically said, OK, this is a relief because it actually relieves some of the tension that existed between the stellar models and the observations at the previous distance of 5.9 megaparsecs. And so that was that was useful to the community. Um, another sort of individual. Uh, this is a pair of galaxies, the Mafi, the, the two ga big galaxies in the Mafi group, Mafi 1 and Mafi 2. Um, the distance to these, this couple has been traditionally uncertain, uh, you'll notice due to the incredible amount of extinction. So this is sort of an infrared image of the Milky Way. And you see these galaxies are just hiding in right along with these huge, this huge quantity of dust. Um, and so that's made distances uh, particularly tricky to measure due to the foreground extinction. And so due to a combination of basically crowding in the HST images, uh, aggravation by foreground extinction and working in the infrared there was, a, there was a mistake with the previous tip of the red giant branch distance of the galaxy, which we sort of sorted out. And we've placed it at five, basically almost double the, the original distance of 5.7 megaparsecs instead of three and a half megaparsecs. And so what this means is that the MOFI group is actually distinct from the neighboring IC342 group, and then the two no longer share an, share an infall region or are in any way related. So these are two separate galaxy groups, which has interesting implications for sort of the formation of the local galaxy plane. Um, both of these groups have velocities towards us and that's due to uh, expanding voids, which I'll talk about in a little bit more. Um, and the last sort of thing I wanna talk about with sort of this collection of accurate distances is a distance to a group of galaxies called the FANGS galaxies. And so FANGS is a collaboration of about 100 scientists. Uh, it's one of these weird acronyms where they decide to capitalize whichever letters they like, but it's the physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies uh, group. So it's a we're studying 116 nearby galaxies, and I was, I was fortunate enough to join this collaboration of excellent scientists. I'm just going to read you what the web page has for what the goals of the survey are. And it's basically to understand the interplay of the small scale physics of gas and star formation with galactic structure and galaxy evolution. Uh, we're using observations of nearby galaxies to understand how physics at the cloud scale um, are affected by galaxy scale conditions and how they affect smaller scale processes and how these influence, uh, influence the evolution of entire galaxies. And so basically what FANGS is doing is, is studying the entire baryon life cycle um, from diffuse atomic gas to molecular gas, star clusters, um, and supernova and, you know, stellar remnants and things like that. And so the, the survey is going all the way from radio to the UV. Uh, they've got ALMA data, HST data, MUSE data. We're going to get JW, JWST data. And so it's a, it's a great set of data to look at nearby galaxies. Um, but for all these galaxies, you need to have an accurate distance to be able to transform, again, your measured observables into physical parameters. Things like if you want to understand your, your physical sizes of your molecular clouds, for instance, or your star clusters or associations. And so I was tasked with putting together a set of distances to these galaxies, which was a sort of two pronged uh, project. One is that the FANGS HST survey um, had parallel imaging in the halos of galaxies, which I was able to extract tip of the red giant branch distances for a dozen galaxies out of. And these range from between four and 15 megaparsecs. And the other half, of the project was doing a careful literature compilation 
of distances for targets without the proper data uh, to measure a TRGB distance. And so I put together a compilation of distances for the FANGS collaboration, which is now being used. Um, and so these include tip of the red giant branch distances that we measure, but also other things like Cepheids and, and the Tully Fisher relation and things like that. And so, you know, again, the key idea here is that these distances are not just valuable to the Cosmic Flows program, but also, you know, pretty much the entire extra galactic astronomical community. Um, and now I want to switch gears a tiny bit and talk about uh, one of the other things, you know, more related to cosmic flows and that sort of local large scale structure. And so a couple of years ago, we put out this paper um, looking at the peculiar velocity structure of galaxies sort of just beyond the local group. And so what is a peculiar velocity? Uh, well, the, when you observe a velocity for a galaxy, it's a combination of two things. One is its motion due to the Hubble flow, and two is its velocity due to gravitational interactions with other galaxies, its interactions with massive neighbors. Um, if you have an accurate distance, you can decouple these two, and that allows you to, you know, basically extract the peculiar velocity. And so, you know, you have some handle on Hubble constant, and you know the distance, and then you can get the peculiar velocity because the observed velocity is easily measured. And the peculiar velocity is really important because it encodes a record of the past galaxy-galaxy interactions as well as the future paths of the galaxy. Um, and so it allows you to understand large-scale structure, but also the evolution of large-scale structure as a function of time. And so let me walk you through this plot. And so there's a lot going on here, so I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on it. And so this is in supergalactic coordinates, um, which uh, the Milky Way is buried in there at zero, zero, and that's how, and part of how the supergalactic coordinate system is defined, um, you'll see a sort of number of different features in the diagram. Um, one is that there are a ton of galaxies either color-coded by whether they're red-shifted or blue-shifted, um, you know, in, our, uh, in terms of peculiar velocity. And so there's, there's a large scattering of these galaxies. And if you look at sort of the, the dominant things that are labeled in this plot, to the north you see something called the local void, which is as you can imagine, relatively empty because it's a, it's a nearby galaxy void. And so you see there are rather few galaxies within this local void. Um, you know, just out of the local void at an SGZ of, Z of zero, you see that there's a ton of galaxies that are sort of piled onto this thing that we call the local sheet. Um, the local sheet is essentially one of the, uh, the walls that bounds the local void. You can think of it as a filamentary. It's more of a plane-like structure that forms one of the walls of the local void, which lies to the supergalactic north. If you go rightwards from the local sheet, you see that peculiar velocities become to get really large. Um, and that's because galaxies are falling onto the Virgo cluster, which lies just to the right of this plot. Um, and then when we go southwards um, to the supergalactic south, we actually see an incredibly coherent um, pattern of peculiar velocities. So if you're looking in the bottom and the bottom right of the plot, you see, you see this thing called the Leo spur, where basically all galaxies that we look at have a, a negative peculiar velocity. That is, they are they seem to be rushing towards us, um, which is which is a strange pattern. Um, and so, how do you how do you resolve this this pattern? The idea is that in you know cosmologically speaking, voids expand, and as they expand, they expel the matter. They expel galaxies from within them. So galaxies are evacuating the void. Um, and in this case, galaxies are, have been evacuating the local void and have been piling onto the local sheet. And so what's happening is that, you know, galaxies coming out of the road, rushing out of the local void, sort of fall onto this sheet called the local sheet. And they all have a peculiar velocity. They all are rushing towards the supergalactic south because the local void, the expansion of the local void is pushing them towards the supergalactic south. So what we really think we're seeing is that the galaxies towards the supergalactic south are not actually coming at us in, in a physical sense, but in, 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 in deep, um, instead we're actually rushing towards them due to our motion that uh, the members of the local sheet are experiencing. The idea is that the local void is expanding, pushing members, uh, pushing galaxies onto the local sheet towards the supergalactic south, and our velocity is imprinted on the galaxies in the Leo spur. And so what we did in this paper is we, you know, we sort of put, put some of this picture together, but we also wanted to look basically exactly in the anti-void direction where velocities are maximized. And so that, you know, directly, you know, 
towards the supergalactic, negative supergalactic Z, negative SGZ direction. And if you want to look in that direction, you'll see that there's a sort of two triangles plotted on this plot. And that's just exactly where the, the center of the Milky Way is. Um, so that's where all the dust is. So it's actually very difficult to look in that direction. Um, so what we did here is we looked at a number of galaxies labeled one, two, three, four with HST. And the idea here is that, OK, if this is if this picture is really you know, what we think it is, those galaxies should really have a peculiar velocity that all point, points in our direction. Um, they should all share that trend of negative peculiar velocities because members of the local sheet are expanding in the negative SGZ direction. And that's what we found with this paper. Um, and so that was, a, that was a good bit of confirmation there. Um, and uh, you know, you'll notice that all the, all the vectors in this plot are pointed towards the Milky Way, at which lies at zero, zero. Uh, this is not some weird, we're at the center of the universe, but we are at the center of our observable universe and that we can only look at uh, velocities that are radial or in our direction. Um, and so if you really wanna get a full 3D picture of what's going on or what's been going on, you have to do, uh, you have to do some uh, numerical analysis. And so, our collaborator Ed Shea, um, you know, has been has been building this model called the numerical action method, or NOM model, which was previously called the least action method, um, or least action principle method. And so the idea here is that you you start at a re you know you have the data for today, you have galaxy distances, and you have the galaxy velocity. So you also have their peculiar velocity. So you have all the all the data that goes along with galaxies today, and you want to basically track this backwards. Um, to model the, the gravitationally induced trajectories of all these galaxies that you have. And so we can we're trying to model this from their present day back to a redshift of four closer when these when these galaxies actually formed. And so what NAM does in its present iteration is that you know we have a sphere of galaxies within 38 megaparsecs that has about four, 1,400 constituent galaxies, either individual galaxies or galaxy groups. Um, and it includes gravitational effects also external to this radius. So it's not just hanging in space, it's also including uh, basically tidal effects out to 100 megaparsecs from cosmic flows. And so with this, we can actually put together a sort of three-dimensional picture of what's been going on since the redshift of four. And so now I'm going to take you in the, into the plane of the local sheet that we see here. And so this is what the plane of the local sheet looks like. So the, the, the dots of the galaxies are where they are today. Um, and you know the vectors point back to the paths that they have taken from a redshift of four in these coordinates. A uh, number of relevant galaxies are highlighted here, but you see that the galaxies in the plane of the local sheet have sort of a very coherent trend in that they're going in the negative SGX and positive SGY direction towards the upper left of the plot. Um, and so they all have this very coherent motion, which is, which is to be expected because that's where the Virgo cluster is. And so we're, we're all being attracted towards the Virgo cluster because it's its large center of mass. Um, so it's nice to see that picture put together. If we wanna look at the same uh, configuration or a similar configuration that I showed you earlier on, this is looking at the local sheet edge on. And so you see towards the supergalactic north at positive SGZ, you have galaxies, you, we can see that all these galaxies were, you know, once part of, you know, once whereas now the local void, they've been evacuating the local void and piling up onto the local sheet where they now form a sort of a, a wall bounding the local void. Um, and they all have this coherent motion where they've all been coming out of the local void. And if you look in the, S, in the negative SGZ direction at the bottom half of the plot, galaxies don't really have a coherent motion sort of up or down in that plot because there is, is uh, they're less of a coherent motion because there's no, you know, they're not being influenced by a void or anything like that. Um, and so this is showing you the, the sort of real trajectories and then everything is also sort of streaming uh, to the positive SGY direction. And that's where the Virgo cluster is to the bottom left of, sorry, yeah, to the bottom left of the plot, you see a, a few galaxies going the other way and that's towards the Fornax cluster. Um, and so, uh, you know, just putting this picture together, we've been able to get a really good sense of galaxies. Uh, the evolution of galaxies, not, you know, galaxy evolution, but the evolution of the trajectories of galaxies and the, the evolution of large scale structure. Uh, we, you know, with this work, we find uh, a set of solutions that are not unique, but physically plausible. And if you run this a bunch of times, you get, you get a similar scenario, a very coherent scenario in that, um, 
you know, the dominant characteristics within the local volume within the 10 to 15 megaparsec region that, that is close to us, galaxies are rushing towards the Virgo cluster and they're rushing out of the local void. And those are the two dominant characteristics that we see. Um, and so I've got all these galaxies plotted up. Uh, so let's, let's talk about them in a little bit more detail. Um, and so, you know, we've been trying to get observations for basically every galaxy that lies within 10 megaparsecs to be able to better nail down large scale structure in, in the nearby universe, because that's where you can do it the best. That's where you can get the best distances. And so we recently had a cycle, uh, a cycle 27 HST program that Brent led. Um, so we gave, we gave them, we gave the folks at uh, Space Telescope a list of 150 galaxies and they observed half of them for us, which is actually pretty good in terms of snapshot measurements. And so we, we made the data and reductions and distances for all these galaxies public recently in the new catalog paper. Um, the, goal, the goal of this work is, you know, get us for every galaxy that we think might lie within 10 megaparsec is get a good TRGB distance. And most of these galaxies don't have any good distance. Um, but beyond, beyond the distances, we also want to get a record of the stars that lie within these galaxies, right? And so with this program, I'm just, I'm just quoting from the program notes, uh, we want to get, with this program, we're able to get a record of all the bright stars in, the gal in these galaxies. So anything brighter than an absolute I band magnitude of minus three, and then even fainter if closer than 10 megaparsecs. So we get information on the stellar content of all of these galaxies that lie in all sorts of different groups. Um, we get a good constituation of, of groups themselves, which galaxies belong to which groups, which satellites belong to which halos. And we also get a clear definition, as I've shown you, of local structure and flows, and also um, transient progenitors. And so, you know, when a supernova inevitably goes off in one of these galaxies, as I think a couple already have, we have information on the galaxy, uh, you know, some constraints on what star produced that supernova because we have pre-explosion imaging from this program. Um, and so with the completion of this program, we're somewhere like 75 to 80 percent of having looked at every galaxy within 10 megaparsecs and getting a complete record of, uh, of their distances. Um, the denominator there keeps, keeps uh, increasing a little bit because people keep finding smaller and smaller dwarf galaxies. Um, but for the most part, we've mapped out the vast majority of the large and sort of mid-class galaxies, um, and, and we're working to complete this. Um, this one over here on GC 5585 is extra nice. Um, it was we we I convinced NASA to make it the Hubble picture of the week. Um, and so uh, you know these are the types of galaxies we're looking at. We're looking at small dwarfs. We're looking at larger spirals, uh, satellite galaxies, edge-on spirals. Basically, you know anything that we think lies within 10 megaparsecs. You know in some of these pictures, based on how much they're zoomed in, you can see the red giant branch stars. Um, and that's what that's what we're looking at. And so there's a lot of information here beyond what, you know, just can be used to get distances to these galaxies, right? I talk about the stellar content of these galaxies. Uh, what can you do with that, that information? What can you do with the color magnitude diagrams beyond just getting distances? And so what we can do is we can use these CMDs uh, to measure the star formation histories of these galaxies. Here's ESO 61 again. What we do is we create synthetic stellar populations and basically try to best fit the observed CMD and model the star formation history. And so for this galaxy, it's relatively close by. It's one of the closest ones in the most recent program. And so the data extends well below the TRGB. Um, but there are many galaxies in this catalog where we can, you know, people have been doing this sort of exercise, but we can do more in the future to learn about things like star formation histories as a function of stellar mass or environment or things like that. Um, so just looking at this color magnitude diagram or just looking at this image, you, you, you'll you notice there's a, a whole lot of red giant branch stars. Um, there's there's also some blue stars, which are main sequence stars, which you see to the, you know, the left half of the color magnitude diagram. And so that tells you just, you know, without even doing anything quantitative, that there is, there is active star formation right now. And there has been a lot of star formation in the past because there's a very well-defined red giant branch. But what can we do more quantitatively so what we, we do is we use isochrones to simulate a large range of stellar populations with a bunch of different ages and metallicities. Uh, we're able to put a constraint on age, initial constraints on age and metallicity by just using some of the observed features. So like the width of the red giant branch will tell you something about the star formation history. 
Um, the relative number of main sequence stars will give you an idea of what uh, active star formation is like. And so with, with some initial constraints and the observed CMD, we can, we can split the observed CMD into bins based on stellar, uh, separate stellar sequences and from that uh, determine a, a best fit star formation history. And so looking at this more closely, you know, you see the picture of the galaxy and the observed color magnitude diagram to the top right. Uh, to the bottom right is the simulated color magnitude diagram. So this is the best fit simulated color magnitude diagram. And from that, we're able to determine a star formation history, which you see on the bottom left. And so the right hand of that plot is the most ancient star formation history. That's, you know, looking towards the past. And you uh, notice, notice the log scales. You'll notice that the vast majority of the star formation for this galaxy happened a long time ago. And then, okay, it sort of tapered off. To what degree? It's a little uncertain because the, mag the, the color magnitude diagram doesn't go deep enough. Um, but, but we can see that there is a sort of tampering down of star formation as we get to intermediate ages. And then as we get to sort of very recent, you know, uh, 10, 100 mega year timescales, there's been an uptick in the star formation history. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we're able to do with these color magnitude diagrams is get a good hold on not just star formation rates right now, but uh, star formation rates as a function of time. And so we're able to map the star formation histories of these galaxies. Um, I talked about transient progenitors. Uh, here, here's a little fun aside. So I got this email from Brent one day, which is pretty atypical. Uh, stop whatever you're doing, give, your, uh, give the attached message your attention. This is a little strange, um, but okay, it sounded important. And so the email was you know, from an astronomer saying a few hours ago, there was a, a gamma ray burst that is seemingly coincident with NGC 4242. Um, and it looks like you just got HST data for that. It looks like it's kind of close to the edge of the chip. Um, can you tell us if it's on the chip? And if it is, you know, at six megaparsecs, this is by orders of magnitude going to be the closest gamma ray burst. Um, it would probably be, it would definitely be naked eye brightness very soon, you know, minutes to hours long time scale. Hurry up and tell us what's going on. Okay. So I'd I had already reduced the data at that point which we actually had just gotten two weeks prior to this gamma ray burst. And so everyone was really interested. You know, this is, the, you know, possibly the closest gamma ray burst that's ever happened. Um, and if you look at our HST imaging, you see it's actually just a background galaxy. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate that it didn't happen in NGC 4242, but we're, we were able to put out a sort of memo that night and save people a lot of big glass time. Um, so... That, that's the kind of stuff you can do. And then in a, a couple of the galaxies in this program, at least I think at least one have had a supernova event, um, a real supernova event in that galaxy. And so there's there's the um, work being done on looking at the progenitors for those galaxies, which we have measured brightnesses for. Um, okay, but that was a fun little aside. Um, and so now sort of coming to the last bit of the talk, I want to talk about uh, this thing called the Hubble constant that you may have heard about um, recently, a little bit of a little bit of interest here. And so to the right, I'm showing you a plot going into ADS, doing a title search for the words Hubble constant, just showing you a num the number of papers as a function of time. So those are two year bins. Um, and you see that uh, there's there's some uncertainty in in the late 90s. There's a lot of there's a lot of papers talking about it, um, and then the results from the HST key project come out that put it at about 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This is work done by a lot of people, but led um, in part by Wendy Friedman. And so, okay, there's a, there's a you know settled down to a base level of papers about the Hubble constant, um, and then further further work in the Cepheid regime by the Shoes team has has sort of put the Hubble constant at 74 kilometers per second megaparsec. And I'll, I'll show you some more, but this is uh, the, the sort of local value of the Hubble constant is something, you know, like 73, 74, 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And then here comes Planck, I'm trying to mess everything up. They, they you know, using, using their information from the cosmic microwave background and assuming a Lambda CDM model, they're able to sort of uh, give you a present day value of the Hubble constant, right? This is what we think the value of the Hubble constant should be today based on, on our CMB data. And it's something like 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec with a really tight constraint. Um, and so there's like something like a four to five sigma tension in the values for the Hubble constant here. 
And so here's here's there's about 10,000 of these plots, but here's just one of them um, showing you know a couple of early universe constraints, so something like Planck, but also other stuff from like uh, baryon acoustic oscillations and Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and they show sort of low-ish values of the Hubble constant, right? Low relative to what we measure in the late universe, or sort of directly by looking at standard candles or things like that. Um, and you'll notice sort of the late results all sort of all they all do fall northward of what is what is sort of predicted by Planck um, to various degrees. And, you know, just going top down, you see the Shoes Project was looking at Cepheids, Carnegie Chicago Group is looking at tip of the red giant brand stars, which we'll obviously talk about. And then we have Myras, which are variable AGP stars from Holy Cow, you get lensing. The Mega Maser Cosmology Project is looking at Mega Masers and you have surface brightness fluctuations. And this plot, if you looked up this plot today, it'd have about 200 papers on it. Um, but sort of the, the, the really the most interesting data point on that plot is, is the red one, is the tip of the red giant branch one. And that's also work led by Wendy Friedman part as part of the Carnegie Chicago Hubble program or the CCHP team. Um, and so the idea is there, instead of Cepheids, you use tip of the red giant branch stars to calibrate the type 1a supernovae. So, you know, instead of going from the TRGB, uh, so instead of going from Cepheids to supernovae to the Hubble flow, you go TRGB to supernovae to the Hubble flow. And that's basically supposed to be a test of Cepheid variables as standard candles. And so what the CCHP team did is get observations for nine supernova hosts and five more from the HST archives. Um, so these are the new the, uh, footprints of the nine new ones they got. So they, they all aimed them in the halos of these nearby galaxies so that they would be less affected by things like crowding and, and extinction. And so the obvious question here is, okay, you do TRGB distances as part of cosmic flows. Um, cosmic flows is traditionally given a Hubble constant of about 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, and that's through a full distance ladder, including, you know, Tully-Fisher measurements, type 1a supernovae, and the whole, the whole shebang. But if you just look at the tip of the red giant branch measurements from cosmic flows, what do we get? And so let's, let's zoom in on one of these. Um, NGC 1316. So this is with 16 HSD orbits, one galaxy. It's part of the CCHP team. And this is the color magnitude diagram on the right is the one I've reduced and put together. And you see that the magnitude of the tip of the red giant branch is, is pretty well defined even at the, even at the naked eye level. Um, and so, you know, you see this picture of NGC 1316 on the left. That's not where the pointing is. The pointing is as the footprint shows you far off into the halo of the galaxy. And the point of that is here are some TRG, stars near the TRGB just plotted cutouts of them. You see that they're relatively unaffected by things like crowding or, you know, just because they're very far off into the halo of the galaxy. And so if you look at Cepheids, Cepheids are in very crowded regions of galaxies because they're in star forming regions. But, but the tip of the red giant brand stars are, are much further out. Um, and so if you want to do a comparison of the CCHP group versus our methodology for the extragalactic distance database, it's important to understand what is actually different in the two groups. Um, and so we use, and this is, this is sort of not by design because our methods had existed for a couple of decades um, and they went off and did their own thing. And so the PSF photometry packages that we use are different. Uh, they're similar in terms of the algorithms that they use, but they're, they're a little bit different in the details. Um, so that's a, that's a good check on just the photometry. Uh, the TRGB determination is different. The CCHP team uses edge detection, whereas we fit a model luminosity function. So that's different. And the calibration, the zero point calibration is different. So they've used uh, mainly uh, the LMC as a calibrator, whereas we've gone, um, this is work done by Luca Rizzi, uh, who's part of our team, um, we've used horizontal branch distances in five nearby dwarf sororal galaxies. And so, you know, even though the, the photo, you know, the, the HST images that we're starting from are the same, but pretty much everything else that you look at, it's as different as can be given that we're starting with the same data. So it's a good check. Um, okay, deep, what do we get? What's the difference? Um, and so what I'm plotting here is the CCHP and EDD distance moduli relative to NGC 4258. I'm showing them relative to NGC 4258 because 4258 also has a geometric distance from its water mega maser. Um, and so you can use it to calibrate the distance ladder. 
And so because we have a TRGB distance to it, you can use it to calibrate the TRGB distances. But basically what you see is the distances are very consistent. Um, we had done like four or five of them before they had put them out and they did they put some out before we had put them out. And so in terms of who did them first, it's about half and half. Um, and they agree, the, the final distance moduli uh, agreed to within a one and a half percent level. Um, and so it's, it's pretty good agreement given the fact that we do a lot of stuff independently and it's a good check on the reliability of the tip of the red giant branch as a distance indicator. Um, okay, what does this mean for the Hubble constant? Uh, so I plotted up a number of galaxies here. Um, nine, nine they got data for in their first paper. They got data for two more in, in a recent program. And then I mentioned that they used five archival fields, uh, four or five archival fields for um, Cepheids. Right. And so those those fields existed for Cepheid variables and they just use them to measure the tip of the red giant branch distances, which is different from what they've done with the new program, um, which is go out into the halos of these galaxies. And so I'm not basically we're not able to re reproduce uh, the distances that they're claiming for the furthest bit of the sample. And so what I'm showing you here on the left is NGC 1316, the same color magnitude diagram I showed you earlier. You see the, the tip of the red giant branch is well defined. Uh, it's it's much brighter than the photometric limit. I've applied the same photometric criteria to all of these galaxies and photometer to them in the same way. And so on the right half of the figure, you see the the four most distant galaxies that the CCHP group group is getting tip of the red giant branch measurements for. Um, and in the top right of each panel, you'll see the HST imaging itself. And so for NGC 1316, you'll see a little galaxy in there that's actually a background galaxy. You can't see NGC 1316 in the data because it's so far off. Um, this field is out in the halo of NGC 1316. If you look at the four Cepheid hosts, you see that the field is actually centered dead on the disk because that's where you want to look at, that's where you look go to look for Cepheid variables, right? These measurements were not designed to look for the tip of the red giant branch. But even beyond location, if you look at, you know, again, this is implying sort of this not sort of this is applying the exact same photometric criteria for the galaxy on the left and on the right um you'll notice that for some of them the the color magnitude diagrams are actually pretty pretty uh not well populated um so what i've done is i've i've you'll see the red circles i'm plotting everything exterior to the red circle because everything to the interior of the red circle is just too affected by crowding it's right in the disk um you'll see there's one there's not a whole lot of stars in some of these galaxies and two um, they're, because they're really distant, the color magnitude diagrams don't go very deep. The red arrows show you the reported location of the tip of the red giant branch based on their data. Um, but if you look, if we look at it, I, it, it's just very sparse and we're not able to get a measurement. And so we think there's, there's some sort of issue with the data quality. Um, basically these four measurements should not be mixed in with the rest of the sample. We think they should be tossed out is basically what I'm trying to convince you of here. It, they're, not the, they're not the same level of data quality. I don't think anyone can argue that. Um, and for something as, as precise as measuring the Hubble constant to the one or two, three percent that we want to do it, uh, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be using this bad data. Um, okay, and the big question is, what do you get for the Hubble constant if you use the distances that we've done for these galaxies um, that I've been doing for the past few years. Um, so we're, we're, these are derived from a 40, NGC 4258 to TRGB to supernova 1A distance ladder. We're assuming the color slope that we've assumed uh, for, for the metallicity dependence. And so the, the, we're, we're tossing four galaxies aside, we're tossing out these four galaxies, but we're also adding two new targets, which were recently obtained by them, but not included in their measurement of the Hubble constant. That they put out. And so each of those galaxies, NGC 1404 and NGC 5643, they both have two supernova events each. So it's basically like adding four calibrators. Um, and so we're removing four galaxies, but we're also adding four calibrators. And so this, the statistical numbers are about the same. And that's the answer. Uh, that, that's the, it's almost close to completion. Um, we get a result that lies somewhere in between what the CCHB team reports and what the Cepheid group reports, you know, something like 71 and a half kilometers per second per megaparsec, um, which puts it in tension, in more tension with the Planck value and more in line with the, the, the rest of the distance ladders 
values. Um, and so this is work that we're, we're close to, you know, we're close to completing, um, but that's the sort of preliminary result there for the Hubble constant. Um, cosmic flows itself will have its own, its own value, um, and that's based on tip of the red giant branch and Cepheid calibrator, using those to calibrate things like the Tully-Fisher relation. I mentioned Eshan, he's done that, and we've, we're getting values of like 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, and with Cosmic Flows 4, once that's done to completion, we'll, you know, we'll see what we get there. But just looking at the tip of the red giant branch, just looking at like these like, you know, four, 13 or 14 galaxies, which is admittedly a little small um, in terms of number of statistics, we're getting something a little northward of what the other team reports. And so the future is bright if this thing eventually goes up. Um, and so I've mentioned with HST, with one orbit, you can get uh, the 10 megaparsecs. It's very clean. With web, you know, something like four or five orbits of char uh, hours of charge time, we can uh, get out to 30 to 40 megaparsecs. Uh, that's an incredible increase in volume. Um, that's a 64 times larger volume where we can really get a good handle on galaxy flows and large scale structure, um, getting really good 5% distances to a ton of galaxies in a much larger, you know, in a much larger portion of the universe. Um, and then with, with that, we'll be able to get a, a distance ladder that's actually completely independent from the TRGB and super, uh, from the Cepheid Supernova 1A distance ladder. And so the current shoes value is Cepheid Supernova 1A to, to the Hubble flow. But if you really want to check that value, what you want to do is you don't want to use Supernova, you want to use something different. And so ideally, you know, people are working on a Gaia calibration of the tip of the red giant branch. And from the TRGB, we can measure uh, surface brightness fluctuations in elliptical galaxies, of which there will be plenty of in this larger volume. Um, and with that, we can take those out into the Hubble flow and measure the Hubble constant. Uh, and so I just want to wrap up there. Um, we've got this incredible catalog um, that I've been working on, but that has been worked on by so many people over the past couple of decades. And we've doubled it in size, over doubled it in size to contain information on the stellar content for 556 uh, galaxies. Uh, all of the photometry is public and open to use. Um, almost 500 of them have a measure of distance from the tip of the red giant branch. And the information within that catalog has provided foundation for a lot of transformative science within local volume. Um, getting really good distances allows you to understand your fundamental galaxy parameters really well. It allows you to get a good handle on local large scale structure. With, with all that information, you can look at the star formation histories of these galaxies. And also you can do things like try to measure the expansion rate of the universe. Um, and so James Webb and uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will launch and they will both sort of blow the field wide open, um, and it's sort of the next big leap. Uh, and so we're excited, we're excited for that. Um, and so I wanna say thank you to a lot of people. Um, oh, everyone uh, who's here, thank you for coming in, tuning in, listening. Um, in particular, I wanna thank these people. I wanna thank Brent, who's been a fantastic advisor and I've learned an incredible amount working with him. Uh, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, the members of my thesis committee, Len, Dan, John, and Ben, um, for their guidance and support of my project. I want to thank all, all, all the faculty at the IFA, all the staff at the IFA um, for their support. I have a number of uh, people I've worked in the past and who have helped mentor me, and I want to thank each and every one of them. Fred, Debbie, Liz, Janice, Schuyler, thank you all so much. Um, I've worked with an incredible group of people as part of Cosmic Flows, including, but certainly not limited to Luca, Esan, Igor, Dimitri, Lydia, and Ed. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks team has about a hundred people. I can't list them all here, but thank you. Um, there's a lot of people at the IFA that make it a, a very fun place to work. And I've really missed that the past, past uh, year or so now. Um, uh, so special thanks to Amy, Carl, uh, Raja, Bill, Kurt, and as well as the rest of the IFA staff. Um, grad school would suck if, if uh, I, there weren't other grad students. Um, but, you know, thankfully, there are other grad students, and they've all been great. Um, so I have special shout out to Sierra, Carrie, Michael, Connor, Anna, Ashley, Zach, Ryan, as well as all of the other grad students. Uh, thanks for thanks for your time, both sort of in and outside of work. Um, I'll really cherish that. 
I want to thank my parents, Ravinder and Gudev, for everything. And I want to thank my sister, Harlene. Um, and I want to thank my partner and fiance, Sarah, for everything as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, questions? Wow. Okay, thanks, Steve. That was, <laughs> that went on for an hour. Uh, we, we still have a little bit of time though. So uh, if we have uh, people, if they can raise their hands, uh, we can invite some questions on what uh, Deep has been talking about. There's there certainly some questions there. So, um, Kurt, can you um, monitor that? Who has the raised hands? Uh, yeah, so uh, Eric Baxter uh, had a couple questions. Um, how well do TRGB measurements with your model fitting approach agree with measurements that use the Sobel filter approach? Uh, in instances where we have a lot of stars pretty well, um, because you know the, the, the key points for the Sobel filter does not work well is when you don't have a lot of stars because then it becomes noisy. And there are things you can do to get around that, but that, to some extent, you know, that's that's always going to be an issue. Um, additionally, in if you're if you're forced to look in a very crowded regime, if you're not actually modeling the amount of crowding, um, that is a very large issue, and that's not something that is built into the Sobel filter framework. That's a correction you can apply afterwards. Um, but yeah, so those are the two big differences. Um, for something like the Carnegie Chicago group, the galaxies that we have in common, they all agree pretty well because those that at least the, the good set of data, what I'm calling a good set of data is, is, is very deep and is very out into the halos where there's relatively minimal crowding. So in cases like that, they, they agree very well. Um, it looks like you've got a second question as well. Uh, and so I can, I mean, I can read it. Is it surprising that slightly different? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, there's a slight delay. I was just saying, yes, please read the question first because uh, the yeah. other folks can read it. All right. And so Eric asks, is it surprising that slightly different galaxy selections that use relative to CCHP results and looks like a significantly different Hubble constant, especially considering that it sounds like excluded galaxies would have distances of large error bars? Um, the CCHP group does not have large error bars on those galaxies. Um, they have pretty small error bars on, I keep messing this up, on the, if you, if you look at the four galaxies here, you know, I, I say I can't measure the distances, but they say they can measure the distances to something like 4%. Um, and so that's a, that's a big difference um, just in that scenario. Um, and so in terms of a significantly different value of the Hubble constant, I wouldn't say it's significant because that's a one sigma error bar. Um, and so they overlap pretty well. Um, and we're also, we're also changing the sample, right? We're taking out four galaxies and putting in two new galaxies with two new calibrators each. And so it's, it's, it is consistent with what you would just expect with noise as well. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a, a not clear measurement in the sense that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't just elucidate everything immediately, right? If we got 75 with our method, that would, that would say something really important, but we're not. Um, part of the problem here is that we just don't have a large number of galaxies because HST time is is hard to come by, especially if you want to look at galaxies that are out past 20 megaparsecs, you need like 20, 30 orbits each galaxy. Um, and there is a push to do that, but Webb will do it a lot better. Um, Roberto has a question. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so Roberto... Should I read it or... I can read it. How, how do TRGB distances compare to SBF distances? Um, it, it depends how you calibrate the two. Um, you know, in general, there is there's decent agreement. Um, a lot of the times, you know, especially right now, people are trying to use TRGB distances to calibrate SBF distances. And so it's hard to get an independent measurement on that. 
um, because the SBF is sort of a secondary distance indicator. You need something like the TRGB to be able to calibrate SBF distances. Um, Additionally, there are not a whole lot of galaxies where you can get both TRGB and SBF distances right now. Uh, The reason is that there's just not a whole lot of big elliptical galaxies within the local volume. Um, There's something like Centaurus A, but that's really messy. Um, And then basically then you have to go into the Virgo clusters at like 16 megaparsecs. And so there's not a whole lot of good places for cross comparison. Um, That's going to change a lot with web. Uh, Okay. I hope I answered your question. Yes. Anybody have uh, any other questions? Please raise your hand or Go ahead, Ishpan. Hi, um, I'd really like to know uh, when you, so this difference you see, um, which is, you know, maybe you could say statistically it's not significant, which is a little bit weird because it's almost the same data. So statistically, if it's the same data, you don't necessarily want to see half a sigma or sigma difference. But having said that, what do, you ext- what do you ascribe to most the difference? In, in other words, if you want to pinpoint the dominating factor, is it the calibration or can you, do you know it clearly where exactly the different come from? Yeah, and so, okay, two things. One, the sample thank is, mo- yeah, thank you for your question. It's not exactly the same, it's mostly the same. So they haven't done a new h naught measurement um, with all of their galaxies and so, because they got 1404 and 5643 newly observed, they have not put out an H naught value with those two. And so those two are things that we are adding to the H naught level. Um, uh, and we're also taking out four. And so the, the, the sample is a little different. And so there is some wiggle room allowed just by that. Um, so that's part of it. And but what if do I pres- the exact same galaxies, would, would the difference be the same or not? Or can you even do that? I can't tell you because I can't measure distances to the four galaxies on the right here is the problem. Um, where they're saying they can get good distances, I'm telling you they can't get a distance. Um, and so that's part of the issue. So the, the, the difference is sort of threefold. It's part of it is this slight difference in the sample, which, you know, it's, it's adding four calibrators and taking out four. So in a, in a sample of like 14 galaxies, that's actually a, a sizable difference. Um, so that's part of it. Um, part of it is due to the methodology. There's about a 1% shift um, due to a combination of the difference in methodology and absolute calibrations. So, you know, part, part of it comes from that. And then the last part comes from what supernova sample you use, um, which is it, it's just a small portion. Um, but whether you use something like the Pantheon set or whether you use the, the Carnegie supernova project set. Um, and that gives you like a 0.2, that, that, that's the smallest contributor. That's like a 0.2 kilometer per second difference um, in the Hubble constant. But it, it's, the, it's the amalgamation of those three. Um, and this is really tricky work to be able to like, you know, pull out what's going on. You know, okay, our, our, gal- you know, our differences are, our galaxies are different to like, uh, distances are different to like one and a half sigma. Um, there's a lot of, sorry, not one and a half sigma, one and a half percent. Um, which in terms of galaxy scaling is, is, is very good uh, agreement. Um, I mean, there's so many things that's different, right? There's photometry, there's calibration, there's, I mean, if you do one thing, like you, you flip this, the parameter on how you measure the sky background, something changes. And so there's a whole lot going on. Um, but basically what we're ab- able to say here is that there's not a huge mis- you know, offset from our distances and their distances. They are pretty well aligned um, given all that is different. And so it's an it's a good independent check on the TRGB distance ladder. Um, basically, we're, you know, our, the two groups are doing an independent check, you know, just themselves, whereas the Cepheid results don't have that kind of independent cross check yet um, because it's, it's, I mean, the real answer is it's a huge pain to build up a pipeline and do those kind of measurements. Um, people are working on it though for the Cepheid. Okay, well. so... So you're saying that you have these three factors and none of them is really dominating, although the, the supernovae are less important than the other two, but each are moving things in the right direction or not the right direction, but the same direction. 
so it becomes more you know larger Hubble constant yeah so the supernova part is not really dominant it's it's the it's the changing of the sample and the difference in the measured distance scales that are changing it in a very small way um yeah. and, and if you were to leave out those four galaxies from their sample would that change their results as well or not yeah so we have something like a 1.5 kilometer per second per megaparsec disagreement um, if you left, I don't quote me on the exact number. It will be in the paper though. Um, it, that ex, I think leaving out those four galaxies explains like almost a kilometer a second, um, about half of that. But, but that's half of two that. thirds. So that's like the, do, so that's the dominating uh, factor. Yeah. So one. something like half, I think, yeah, something like half, half to 1.5 to one kilometer per second. I'm, I'm blanking on the exact number, but it's, it's a sizable fraction is, is, chopping those, throwing those galaxies out and putting two new ones in uh, okay. that calibrate for, for supernovae. Cool, thank you. Sorry for getting all these details, but this is all about details. So. No, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate thank you. Question. Can I ask a question? Okay. Uh, what In that last spot you were showing deep where you have the four galaxies that were, you were questioning, uh, where to go? Yeah, you said you can get a measurement from there, but it looks like in the middle top one, NGC 1309, I can draw by eye a pretty clear line to the TRGB there, right? Why so can't you redraw, re recalibrate it based on their own data. Right, and so the difference here is just the approach. Um, we really to. To measure it, we really have to have a magnitude below the tip of the red giant branch to be able to properly model the luminosity function of the RGB stars. And if uh -huh. you don't have that, then you're running, you know, you just, you, you run into an error of like, I don't have any stars and then the modeling doesn't work. Um, you'll also notice that the, the filter set is not the same between the galaxy on the left and the galaxies on the right. The galaxy on the left is F606, F814. The galaxies on the right, because they were Cephe data, is F555 data. So that filter is bluer than F606 um, because you wanted to measure Cepheids with it in the past. Um, because it's bluer, you're losing red giant branch flux. Your red giant branch is essentially being pushed off to the right of the color magnitude diagram. And so part of what we're not able to see on the four plots on the right is we're losing part of the red giant branch, uh, you know, just because we can't pick up the, we can't pick up the color of the stars um, because that filter is bluer um, than the F606 filter that's preferred. Okay. So as usual, <coughs> things are not so simple. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's tricky business, <laughs> um, which is, is unfortunate because people want a clear answer, but you know, so <laughs> it's, it's messy. Um. There's another question in Q&A. Um, oh, okay. I'll, I'll read it. Um, in the slide with the local set 38 and 39, there are a couple galaxies with curved paths. In the absence of proper motion data, how do you get that kind of motion? Uh, you're right. We don't have proper motion data. We just have the radial Oh, I've over skipped it. Uh, we don't have, we just have radial velocities. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at this just observationally, you, you know, you get just things in your direction. Um, this is because we're actually modeling the orbits. And so we're modeling galaxies that are passing by near each other. And so you're able to get those curved paths because we're modeling the full orbits of the galaxies, not just what we observe. Um, and so that's a benefit that you get from the modeling that you can't possibly get out of observations currently. And so you'll notice that the, the, some of the galaxies with the extremely curved paths, like the, the one in the sort of magenta or pink here, um, those are those are often tend to be smaller dwarf galaxies, which have been perturbed by their interactions with larger systems. Um, and those are also the galaxies which are have the most chaotic solutions. So if you ran this again, you'd probably get a different curved path for that one. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, no more open questions. Anybody indeed want to add to that? 
Well, okay, so we've already had one question from John, uh, who's uh, on the panel. I think it's at this point that we should uh, uh, let everybody else leave and just retain the people uh, from the panel. So uh, let's thank uh, Deep for this really good talk. And then the panel will, and Deep will continue on. Uh, and everybody else can leave. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Deep.